Our next speaker is from a, a federal agency you probably never heard of. Not, I'm just kidding. Anyway, this guy is uh, definitely an expert. He's been out in the field for years. Please welcome Raymond Hunt. Thank you very much. Anyway, I work over on the other side of the country in Beltsville, Maryland. The Beltsville Agricultural Research Service is one of the largest and oldest agricultural research centers in the world. Now, the cultivation of soil, applications of fertilizers and pesticides, crop breeding have contributed to record yields of corn and other crops in the United States. Uh, globally, all the areas suitable for agriculture are already being farmed, and we're losing that land for cities and roads and other development. So the human, increasing human population will require more food to be grown on less land in a sustainable manner. And what this does is all the increases in corn yield have been through the application of newer technologies. However, increases in agricultural production often result in increased soil erosion and poor water quality from excess nutrients. The Chesapeake Bay is getting poisoned by all of the farms uh, draining into it. And so both farmers and the environment will benefit from increased agricultural efficiencies of all these agrochemicals. Now, precision farming is a whole set of different technologies, and you don't have to adopt all of it in one go. Most uh, precision farming, it deals with a very small part of the farm, and the basic technology is a yield monitor, uh, which has a, a GPS on it, and it measures essentially in, a, in an area of about 10 meters by 10 meters uh, how, what, how much is that land producing? It maps out areas of high and low yields, uh, and these are now standard on most farm equipment. Uh, harvesters. High yields require more fertilizer for next year. So they can actually predict approximately how much fertilizer just simply from the yield from the previous year. The yield potential of a ground is relatively stable year after year due to the soil properties. And depending on the crop variety and weather, yields explain 25 to 75% of the variation in fertilizer requirements. Soil properties vary uh, on the scale of 10 to 20 meters. So a management zone can be created from the yield monitor data, and that management zone becomes into a geographic information system, which is then given to the farmer. In-season management, based on information from crop monitoring and a decision support systems, can give an idea of how much extra fertilizer the, the, uh, the crop needs, and the, so any benefit of a small UAS will come from, uh, essentially from in-season management. And one of the things I want to say is the margin of benefit is a lot smaller. We're not talking about UAS versus no precision agriculture. We're talking about UAS versus all the other techni technologies of precision agriculture. Uh, one of them is these on-the-go proximal sensors like the crop, seeker, crop circle or green seeker. They go along the road with a tractor measuring NDVI. Farmers have known about NDVI since the 70s, okay? They're not going to be surprised, but NDVI doesn't work, okay? Because of crop variety, different soil types, weather, okay? Uh, basically what have to do is farmers plant high and low fertilizer strips to calibrate the sensor response to the nitrogen requirement. Now in Japan, small UAS are used to apply fertilizers and pesticides, but there's a big difference in the type of farming. Okay, the rice fields 
are small and muddy, and you cannot use heavy farm equipment to sit there and manage the crop. In the U.S., it's very dry, we have very large fields, and we have big, heavy farm equipment. You're not going to get, even with one of these Yamahas, you're not going to get enough uh, pesticides or fertilizers to go even a quarter section. The key tech, one of the key technologies is variable rate application. Farmers generally apply more agrochemicals that, uh, on the chance that good weather will lead to bumper yields, bumper crops. The uh, idea is later in the growing season, they will, uh, basically the, the crops will be nitrogen starved. And so they will not be able to take advantage of that good weather. Uh, so basically you apply different amounts of fertilizers over the field based on the GPS and G GIS. So the, the small UAS creates this geographic uh, information system layer. Less nitrogen and pesticides are applied, so less nitrogen and pesticides escape into the environment. Now this is how I got started uh, 17 years ago. Okay, I, I started developing a science project for a USDA NASA summer educational program called uh, basically the engineer in Spanish and imagine excellence. So we got the, the kids out flying the UAV with a buddy box. Well, actually, this was a radio controlled model airplane with a buddy box. And we had a very simple automatic camera. And the yellow uh, film was, uh, was because we used Kodak CIR uh, color film, and it needed a yellow filter. So it protected the camera and provided the filter. And we collected pretty good images. And we could see that it had the potential to provide a lot of data. But simply the technology wasn't there. Okay, we, we needed better technology to make it applicable. Uh, I worked uh, in the mid-aughts uh, with a uh, Maryland company, Intellitech Microsystems, which is now called Maryland Aerospace. They had the Vector P, which had a very large payload, and we could start using to, uh, it to carry multi-spectral sensors uh, and acquire 2.2 centimeter pixels. Whoops. Okay, at the Beltsville Agriculture Research Center, we're in the DC flight restricted zone. So uh, basically, here is my tier one platform, and here's my tier two platform. Okay, so we, we simulate the imagery from UAS trying to get the best information possible. Why? Well, we've been studying using sensors to try to predict nitrogen requirements for 40 years. Why isn't people, why aren't people using it? Well, it's a lot harder than it looks because here, if you take this basically uh, one and a half feet by one and a half feet square, you see it has a mixture of dark areas, soil, and light areas. So if we took even a small pixel here of about, oh, three square feet, what it happens is it averages out all the signal and you lose it. So there is no uh, relationship between the nitrogen that is in the plants versus what you're measuring. However, if we get small pixels and are able to image the individual leaves, now we've got a good system. These pixels are, by the way, uh, less than a millimeter squared. Uh, with, with corn, early in the growing season when you can manage the nitrogen, there is not much difference. But in the later growing season, past the point of when it really is profitable to uh, fertilize, now you've got a really good signal. So the signal that we can measure comes too late to use. We have to get earlier signals and basically the way to do that is smaller pixels. Now, unlike uh, the previous talk, you do not need to get picture by picture overlapped with uh, 
with uh, the pixel stitching software like Pix4D or what I use, AdjaSoft PhotoScan Pro. Okay, you can get a transect across here. You can analyze an individual photograph for how much nitrogen that point needs. And then you creak it and put it into a GIS map. The deliverable to the farmer is the information in the geographic information system map, not the imagery. That's the raw data. Okay, so transects work just as well and are a lot less uh, expensive, a lot less costly to uh, create and distribute. With uh, in potatoes, Colorado potato beetles are really voracious pests of potatoes and other vegetables. Insecticides are used extensively to control these beetles on commercial fields. But we eat what's underground, which isn't affected by all of the pesticides. Uh, we use the DGI, G, DGI spreading wings uh, hexacopter and a Tetracan Mini MCA. Uh, multi-spectral camera array with an incident light sensor here. So we're able to get reflectances. Reflectances have the information, not digital numbers. We set up with, with our partners at our Oregon State, we set up uh, manipulation experiments where we put more bugs on the plants. We did flights all through the uh, gr growing season. And here, June 23rd, two, year, two years ago, okay, the crops looked like this, okay? There is really no damage at all. The next day, okay, overnight, the, the beetles emerged in the fifth instar and started just basically having a big uh, buffet feast here. Okay, and we did verify that these areas here are areas where the uh, bugs came and ate the leaves. So this is overnight. Now the other thing is, is if we had again, a pixel size of about three square feet, four square feet, we're not gonna see this. So again, getting the smaller pixels allows us to get more information. And again, you do not have to uh, sit there and stitch the photographs together. You can do a transect, you can use uh, feature extraction software and basic simple rules such as small irregular patches of missing plants to be completely surrounded by a full canopy. So simple rules can now classify that damage fairly accurately. Now, forget everything but what I just said. <laughs> okay, uh, what the the, the current trend is plant height is a very sensitive indicator that of uh, how fast the plants are growing. It's a sensitive indicator of stress. Right now, uh, the basically all your crop breeding companies like Monsanto and DuPont Pioneer are investing a lot of time using plant height as a way of determining the phenotype of thousands and thousands of new plants very quickly. Uh, so we can see that the areas with the, where the canopy was destroyed, you get a, a hole in the canopy. So you can start perhaps using height uh, with, the, with these uh, basically the very high resolution point clouds. Now, when you're using a point cloud, you have to have the overlap, you have to have uh, a big, large image. Basically, uh, agronomists may be actually using these uh, things to actually go through the field. So the goal is you have to know what you want to deliver to the farmer. What are you going to deliver to your customer? And you have to use the technology uh, appropriate for that. So, sensors acquire data, not information. The farmers and users want the information. Okay, the pictures are just, are just raw data. Okay, the requirements for small pixel sizes comes from the methods of uh, analyzing the data 
to acquire the information. Uh, the deliverable product may be a geographic information system, not a stitched image. Uh, nutrient management services are only required one or two months per year. So UAS service providers are going to have to be very diversified. They're not going to make money just by focusing in on crops. I mean, even the growing season of crops is like three, three, four months long. So what are you going to do all winter? Uh, UAS are very flexible and different sensors may be configured to detect pests, plant diseases, weeds, irrigation efficiency, and erosion. Uh, the low hanging fruit has already been picked for agriculture. So you need to start, everybody needs to start working together uh, to come up with better methods to provide the data to farmers. So will using small UAS for precision take, agriculture take off? Eventually, because it's a great and cheap way of getting the information needed. And I want to, to even though I'm the author of this talk, I have lots of colleagues, lots of collaborators from USDA, Oregon State University, Boeing Research and Technology, Paradigm, ISR, Falcon Scan, and uh, I really appreciate the time and the invitation for speaking here. Thank you.